Hello, hello. My name is Simon. This is my review of the Lin Whale 10 keyless keyboard, which as we can see here, is a fairly simple wedge design, uh, more Korean oriented in terms of design aesthetic, uh, TKL. Uh, now this particular unit here is the uh, base model, which has, uh, well, essentially, two-piece aluminum uh, with uh, no internal or external weight, uh, though the keyboard is quite hefty as the bottom case uh, size is quite substantial. Now this uses a simple, uh, more OG, uh, Korean seamed design where the uh, bottom case and the, top and the top case have a noticeable seam in between them and uh, normally this presents uh, competent makers a way to be able to match the anodization color and reflection of both the top and bottom piece for, you know, a very, very classy and uh, old school looking keyboard feel. Now, uh, this keyboard right here has about a nine degree angle as measured, and uh, there's very little information available, at least uh, to the Western audience, about the uh, specifications of this keyboard. Uh, the group buy was run uh, only in Korea, for about $300 for the base model, and then uh, close to $400 for a special edition, uh, which is, uh, well, special. Uh, besides that, I think we should just uh, jump right in and take a look at the case. Alrighty, here we are with the case externals. Now, as covered before, this is a very, very generic uh, Korean type design. Uh, Korean design elements are basically as follows. Uh, you will have a five millimeter uh, bezel on the right and left and uh, eight or nine, sometimes ten, on the top. Uh, also the uh, spacing between the navigation cluster and the 60% area is, well, it's A87 or B87 spacing. Uh, another notable Korean design element is, of course, the wind keyless blockers, uh, which go up slightly higher than a standard keycap and have more sharp edges. Uh, in addition to this, we've got the general edges, which tend to be a lot more sharp and a lot less rounded than a Western designed keyboard. And then we have, for the very first time, by Lin, a top side engraving or a fancy engraving uh, for ATKL and this says whale. Uh, this is the second round of the whale and the first round of the whale, if I remember correctly, does not have this special engraving. If we take a look at the back, we can see the spot for a USB B mini connector, which uh, isn't great, but it's fine. There's a little bit of a crevice here that allows you to uh, essentially align your uh, your your USB cable in the dark, or if you can't see properly. And uh, in terms of the sides, you'll have to excuse my fingerprints all over the place because the anodization is not great. At handling fingerprints and for the sides we've got a you know uh, kind of a corsa side and then with a angle cut out here at about 30 degrees uh, in terms of design it's kind of reminiscent of uh, you know a stealth fighter like an f117 or something like that uh, traditionally this uh, area would have just gone all the way down and just made a simple wedge and then we've got an additional cut here. Uh, again, this is purely stylistic. We've got our screw taps. And then on the bottom, we've got non-standard bump-ons. So these are uh, custom bump-ons. Uh, the material is not super soft. It's about on par with a standard 3M8 or uh, 12 or 13 millimeter bump-on. Uh, keep in mind that the screws seen here are not the original screws. These are the screws from a Zeal Zephyr as uh, I was uh, told by the actual owner of this board, a friend of mine, 
that uh, the original screws were not that great. Aside from this, we can take a look at the anodization and machining quality. Uh, and uh, to be honest with you, it's not spectacular. Uh, firstly, we've got the anodization matching. Now, keep in mind, this is a replacement top. This is not the top that came with this keyboard. However, the original top also had issues matching. Now, uh, we've got a clear reflectivity match right here. Uh, now, my lights are incredibly bright and it makes it kind of hard to tell, but right here, you can see how much darker the top is than the bottom. Uh, the original top had the same issue. And uh, if we look closely, we can see a lot of dings here and there. Uh, before we do that, let's uh, cut into a nice close-up. We can see that there's a brushed aesthetic here, but uh, I assume this is uh, intentional, the brushed aesthetic. However, it's wildly inconsistent. Uh, if, we look, uh, if we look here, let me clean that up. If we look here, okay, that is not cleaned up. If we look very closely, we can see the horizontal lines. And a lot of the horizontal lines, all right, let me try and, Grab focus. A lot of the horizontal lines are all over the place. They're not perfectly straight. Uh, a lot of them look like just really big scratches, even though they're not. This is, you know, a chosen design aesthetic. Not the biggest fan of this. Uh, for, for something coming out of such a high-end maker, it's really not great. Uh, to the touch, it feels relatively rough. Uh, what I assume uh, they did was uh, essentially uh, bead blast this to uh, 120 or 140 grit essentially and then brush it and uh, I've done a brushed finished on one of my boards and it looks rather nice but this is just inconsistent I mean right there you can see what looks like a massive scratch though that's just you know part of the uh, part of the lines and uh, same thing over here so the the brushing was not well done and then in addition to this, if we look at the anodization spe uh, specifically, let me grab focus. Here we can see the huge difference between the top and bottom anodization matching. Uh, in addition, we can see that the edges in the seam were not well polished and not well maintained. And uh, in terms of machining are kind of subpar. Uh, this right here, this could have been from uh, assembly from the previous owner. so. We'll gloss over that. And then for the sides, whoop. give me a second, guys. For the sides, we noticed something very similar, that the seam, the seam is not super clean. The uh, matching is not great. And uh, even uh, just looking at the general anodization of the bottom piece, we can see a lot of inconsistency in, uh, in both color and texture. And this carries over to the entirety of the bottom piece. Uh, give me a second. As you can tell, this thing is a massive fingerprint magnet. And I'm not a big fan of that. That's just caused by the type of anodization and the, uh, incredibly, uh, the incredibly smooth grit for the bead blast. But if we look really closely, we can see just general inconsistency everywhere. Uh, let's go back to our macro cam. But there's a lot of color and pattern inconsistency all over the place, which is uh, quite sad to see. Uh, if we take a uh, look at the edge, the edges are not super clean in terms of uh, in terms of the anodization. Like this one looks okay, but there's other edges that are not so great, like here and whatnot. Not spectacular and uh, quite noticeable here. It's uh, quite rough, uh, not well finished. Again, this is the Korean design aesthetic where uh, the corners are rather sharp and that makes them incredibly difficult to uh, essentially hand polish uh, once, uh, uh, once the uh, machining is done. All right, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tear this down off stream or off screen and uh, we're gonna pop into just a small little rant about the state of Korean keyboards and keyboards like this specifically. And uh, when we come back, we will have it fully disassembled. 
All right, little pause on the video. We're gonna do a real talk, okay? Big old real talk. Now, this, of course, was about 300 bucks on group buy. And that group buy was done in Korea only, uh, which then meant that the, uh, well, the units sold to the Western audience were significantly more expensive. Uh, this belongs to a friend of mine and he paid 900 USD for this. In addition, to another 300 for a replacement top. Now, the anodization quality of this is subpar. The finishing and machining is subpar. In general, this unit is barely worth the $300 group by price. It has no internal weight, no external weight. Uh, the assembly is so intensely simple that, you know, this is something that could have realistically come out of KBD fans. Uh, the top doesn't even match the bottom color. And that's, I don't know, that's kind of an indicator of the Korean customs market. Now, Korean customs used to be great, but they have failed to evolve at the same rate as Western designed, obviously made in China, customs. Uh, this includes stuff like uh, like Lin as well as LZ. Uh, a lot of people will affirm to the fact that uh, LZ quality control has completely dropped off ever since the original uh, CLS, the TKL, uh, where uh, prices had gone up and uh, machining and finishing quality had gone down. And then the cherry on top, obviously, was that uh, was that the quality control was terrible, and this is something that a lot of people have noticed with recent Korean keyboards. I'm not saying they're bad, I'm just saying they have not evolved at the same pace in terms of finishing quality as Western design keyboards. And that leads to situations like these. Now, uh, in Korea, these, uh, at least from, uh, from my research, I went through the uh, Korean KBD lab forum, which I have an account for, I checked out the marketplace, and I saw what the whale was actually selling for. And realistically, within Korea, these sell for 300, 350 USD. And then for the special edition, obviously, quite a bit more since that was more expensive at group buy. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, I don't know how to explain it, but there's a stigma in Korea when it comes to flipping. Uh, flipping is not tolerated within Korea. And uh, on KBD lab forums, for example, it is a bannable offense to flip. So as a result, a lot of Koreans are flipping to Westerners using, you know, Western forums such as Mech Market or Geek Hack or, you know, whatever. And uh, this allows them to get away with stuff like this, where you've got a pretty subpar disappointed keyboard that is barely worth its retail price and then selling it for, I believe the first units uh, sold to Westerners sold for 800 to 850 USD. Now, there's a lot of expensive Western keyboards. You've got Keycult, you've got TGR, uh, you've got Singa KBD, uh, you've got uh, Heine that does uh, really good stuff. You've got AE boards, you've got UPAS. Anyway, there's, there's a lot of guys that, <clears throat> that make very, very high quality stuff. And for that, if you're paying, you know, 500 to 550 for a TKL, you at least get a decent delivery in terms of uh, machining quality, uh, finishing quality, quality control, and of course, you know, a decent amount of customer support. In addition to that, you've got a nice sounding and a nice feeling board. And in general, this whale just doesn't feel and doesn't sound like a $900 keyboard. This barely feels and sounds like a $300 keyboard. I've put hours and hours of effort into trying to, you know, resolve the sonic issues of this keyboard to no avail because, you know, it can only get so good. And I kind of want to put this out there as like some sort of PSA, which is, you know, avoid Western flipped keyboards. Uh, Koreans will continue flipping because they can't flip locally. I mean, they can, but off the books, and it's very complicated, and you have to do multiple alternate accounts and whatnot. But in general, don't buy Western flipped keyboards. The quality of Western, uh, sorry, don't buy Western flipped Korean keyboards, as the quality of Korean customs, especially in the past, 
we'll call it 24 to 28 months, has gone really, really downhill compared to Western designed uh, Chinese produced keyboards. So keep that in mind and we'll pop back into the review. Alrighty, here we have the internals. Now I've neglected to mention up until this point for a very good reason that this is a sandwich mount case. And uh, there are multiple ways of doing sandwich mount. This is a pressure fit non-screw sandwich, uh, meaning the area at which the plate sits onto the top and bottom case has no screw points. Uh, keep in mind that this uses the, uh, the TGR Jane plate, uh, which is a fairly standard plate to use for TKLs. So uh, it's possible to swap this out with another plate. So we can see here the little landing areas, and we can see that the case is screwed in in completely different portions. So uh, this essentially allows for a little bit of play left and right, as well as up and down. Uh, when, uh, when the case is assembled, uh, instead of having screws go directly through the plate mounting points to help align the plate to stay in place. Uh, the issue with something like this is it's possible to have the plate sit too low or too high. And if it sits too low, then it's possible the uh, space bar can make contact with the case top or the uh, left and right shifts can make contact with the wind keyless blockers. I actually had this issue. And then in terms of being too high, uh, this can possibly, though uh, very unlikely, interfere with your function row contacting the top case as well. And then uh, for left and right, there isn't that much variance, but again, it's entirely possible that uh, some of the keys on the very sides of the case could possibly contact the, uh, the, uh, the top case. Uh, besides from that, we can uh, we can see here we've got our our cutout for our USB port right there. Fairly simple, nothing fancy, and we can see that the uh, obviously the top and bottom case uh, contact point is completely flat. Uh, normally, uh, you try to avoid this for uh, alignment and sonic reasons. Though there's enough screws here to make sure that the uh, bottom case and the top case are correctly aligned. Though it is possible to get a slight offset, which uh, essentially can uh, can make the seam not sit as flush as it should. Uh, realistically though, like I said, uh, the fact that this thing has this many screws means it probably sits just fine. Now, uh, the, the depth of the bottom case is not that deep. Uh, this is uh, slightly less than one centimeter or exactly one centimeter. And we can see that this whole honking thing right here is just a solid piece of aluminum. Uh, as a result, the case bottom is incredibly, incredibly heavy. Uh, we can actually just weigh the case bottom. So the majority of the weight comes from the case bottom. Now, uh, keep in mind that uh, this version of the whale has no internal or external weight, though it is not necessary, in my opinion, So the case bottom alone is 18, 13 grams, just shy of two kilos just for the case bottom. And that's pretty massive. Uh, if we were to compare that to the case top for a total amount, we would be looking at about, call it 835 grams for the top uh, fully assembled. Uh, now keep in mind that uh, switches and keycaps alone will add about 400 grams. So uh, we can, we can go ahead and just state that, you know, pretty much all of the weight here comes from the bottom. Uh, besides, uh, besides that, nothing super fancy going on here. These crew threads are uh, decently done. So it's a, uh, I, I don't know what the technical term for a thread like this, but the screw does go in and it sits flush there. Uh, one issue that I did have, which I have with a lot of boards, so I'm not really gonna complain about it is that uh, these uh, these screws here are recessed pretty deep and the holes are not as big as I would have liked them, uh, which uh, prevented me from using uh, quite a few of my screwdrivers and I had to go ahead and use this one because it has a uh, long and skinny head. 
Now, in terms of the PCB, this is the uh, Fave 87, and this is basically the standard LIN uh, TKL PCB. Uh, it uses Boot Mapper Client, which uh, or PS2 AV, which I'm obviously not a big fan of. Uh, it has a lot of issues uh, when it comes to flashing. It's very picky with USB cables. Uh, it doesn't offer you the same level of macro support as QMK or VIA. And uh, again, uh, the uh, way that PS2 AV works is it's called PS2 AV. It's actually simulated USB. It's not even proper USB, which adds inherent delay uh, compared to QMK when it comes to key presses and the response of said key presses. Let's take a closer look at the PCB. All right, there we go. It is relatively clean. I I, per, I personally love the purple uh, the purple uh, the purple color scheme. Uh, let's get rid of that. I personally love the uh, purple color scheme because it essentially hides your flux mark so you don't see big old brown patches. Uh, nothing super fancy. There's no notations of uh, key switch locations, which isn't really an issue for your alphas. But uh, when you're trying to solder a bottom row, that's oopa. when you're trying to solder a bottom row, it's quite handy to know which one of these ports or which one of these locations uh, the actual switch should go in. Uh, not, not the biggest annoyance, but it's something. Uh, besides that, it doesn't suffer from too much Swiss cheese. I mean, it does a little bit here in the, uh, well, the, uh, the left window side, essentially, or the left control side. It's a lot of Swiss cheese here. Again, more or less, that's fine. I've had no crooked switches. Uh, again, I am using a full plate here, so that shouldn't really matter. Uh, we can see that there are uh, locations for uh, surface mount RGB LEDs that are not on this particular version of the, uh, of the keyboard. But overall, I don't have a major issue with the, uh, the uh, hardware of the PCB. Uh, it's OK. I would have liked to see some notation. Obviously, I would have liked to see a port from this decade. That would have been nice. Uh, my major issue, of course, is the uh, firmware. And uh, PS2 AV was great in 2013 to 2016, but uh, pretty much everybody's very, very comfortable with VIA now. And uh, as long as uh, QMK is properly supported, it can be ported to VIA very, very easily. Now, in terms of the plate that we've got here, this is actually a stainless steel plate, which is uh, quite sad. Uh, stainless steel is relatively high pitched compared to uh, aluminum or brass or FR4 or acrylic or basically anything else besides like titanium. Uh, stainless steel is very, very high pitched. Uh, we can see here that this is electroplated with what looks like zinc, I assume, or uh, some other black electroplating. Uh, it's incredibly thin and uh, scratches off incredibly, incredibly easy. Uh, I have. Uh, a replacement plate somewhere in here that's uh, the same plate but it's just completely scratched up and uh, just uh, just to make it clear how easy it is to scratch this you can actually scratch the plate with the pins of your switches so if you accidentally move your switch across the plate trying to get it in the hole then you're gonna leave a big old scratch on your plate uh, I would have preferred to see better finishing personally uh, in terms of the plate fitment in bottom row it's not bad at all. So there isn't too much Swiss cheese here on the bottom row. Uh, you've got your uh, acoustic cutouts uh, for the bottom row as well as the stabilized keys. Uh, these actually have made the stabilized keys sound worse than they should. Uh, it is uh, incorrectly believed that adding acoustic cutouts near your stabilized keys will actually reduce rattle but uh, what it will do right there what it will do most definitely is increase the pitch uh, since you're allowing a small area here through which sound can move through and logically when sound is constricted the the uh, pitch will be raised uh, normally this wouldn't be a problem but we've got a 
a high pitched sounding plate, uh, stainless steel, which is sandwich mounted uh, into a case which raises the pitch even more. And uh, I would have liked to see this whole design be handled a lot better, in my opinion. Uh, this, uh, this keyboard could have very, very easily been top mount. Uh, obviously, that would have required that the uh, top case uh, uh, total thickness get extended a little bit. I can see that there were a lot of cost-saving uh, cost measures here to keep the price point low uh, for you know the overall kit, because of course this was only $300. But for the uh, price that a lot of people are paying these days, uh, I don't think that is a fair price at all. Uh, in terms of uh, machining complexity, there's small little edges where the plate will sit, though again, uh, the plate has a little bit of lateral as well as vertical movement, which is a little bit annoying. And uh, we can see the ledge that goes all the way across. And this is the ledge on which the PC uh, on which the plate sits, and uh, by by increasing the total plate contact area, you are again raising the pitch. Now, overall, raising the pitch is not a bad thing if you're going for a more Korean sounding or a more you know generic OG Korean sounding build. Now, uh, Korean builds tend to be uh, quieter and a little bit higher pitched. And that's a uh, preferential and stylistic thing uh, versus Western design keyboards that are more thocky and will have uh, you know a more internal reverb as well as a deeper sounding bottom out. Uh, I don't hate the sound of the of the chosen design aesthetics. I hate the sound of the subpar plate and. Uh, I think replacing this with a FR4 plate would help quite a lot, and uh, maybe there could be uh, you know some uh, some modifications that could be done to the uh, plate landing area on the top and bottom PCB that would help the sound out a little bit. Now again, the sound for this is not terrible, but it could be improved quite a lot. Uh, my main issues with this case are quality control, finishing, and machining. Uh, the sound, of course, is 100% preference, so a lot of people may prefer the sound of this over something else. Uh, however, I stick to my guns in saying that, you know, uh, for the price point that people are currently paying for this, it is not a worthwhile investment. Uh, we'll pop straight into a sound test, uh, see if you guys like it. Like, I don't hate it, but it's not my preferred sound. And then after that, we'll recap. Okay, so we just spent, what, 20 minutes complaining about this keyboard? So let's stop here. Let's stop here and have a little bit of a real talk. Now, for the original group buy price of $300, if we look at the value proposition there, at $300, getting a, uh, you know, a Korean design, Korean aesthetic, uh, Korean sound and keyboard with a seam design, 
for about 300 bucks. That's not bad. Honestly, that's not bad. And if you're capable of picking one of these up for $300 and you really like the Korean sound aesthetic and you're okay with a sandwich mount in terms of uh, plate feel and sound, go for it. My issue, of course, is the price at which this is being sold to the Western audience. And my other issue is that the Western audience is purchasing it. See, as covered before, there are keyboards that are worth that money. And that is completely, you know, preference. It's not an objective statement. So it's kind of up to you. But in my opinion, for far cheaper, you can get, you know, better anodization matching, better quality control, a keyboard with a weight, uh, more complex design aesthetics, and something that sounds more like you would want, uh, you know, as a Western buyer, for example. Uh, I mean, this particular unit is what, $1,200 in, and the uh, the owner, a friend of mine, still needs to buy a replacement plate because the current plate is terrible for his sound uh, for his sound preferences, as well as mine. And then it would have to be rebuilt again and prop and probably tuned uh, for the uh, plate uh, plate landing locations for the sandwich mount in order to make it sound a lot better. Now, is this keyboard terrible? No, this keyboard is fine. This keyboard is fine at three hundred dollars. I mean, here on this channel, if you watch my videos, you know that for me the value proposition is everything. And you know. There are keyboards that are worth a substantial amount of money, in my opinion, because, of course, preference is everything. But this I am not the biggest fan of. I am not the biggest fan of. I would prefer that somebody uh, who really wants a Lin or a Korean custom maybe get a Lin montage. That's kind of a budget board. Uh, if, uh, if you guys are interested in buying a Korean custom, keep in mind that, as covered before, Korean customs... Uh, the quality control, anodization quality, and anodization matching is not up to speed with the Western makers that, you know, are up there. Uh, consider buying, you know, a budget Korean TKL when it comes out. Buy it directly from Korea. Figure it out. It's not hard. If I can figure it out, you can figure it out. Uh, your target price point should be like, you know, a maximum of $300. At $300, um, all for getting, you know, a nice, simple... Uh, Korean design TKL, but uh, if we're talking something like LZ pricing, where you're paying 550, maybe even 600, or God forbid more, you're not really gonna get your money's worth. Uh, maybe they will flip for a large amount in the future, but it's eventually the community as a whole is gonna decide that the quality of the keyboards is subpar, and nobody's gonna really want it anymore. So. I guess that's my review. Like, I, I don't want to give this a number rating because, again, at $300, this is a thumbs up for me. But at $1,200, this is a big, big, big no-no from me. And, uh, yeah, that's it. That's the Lynn Whale review. Catch you guys on the next one. And for $1,200, Jesus, that's, uh, that's rough. That is incredibly rough. Which which essentially, you know, ties to the, the fuck, why am I so fucking bad at videos?